All right, guys, let's keep this show rolling. We're back from intermission, so get settled in with your drink and get ready for some science. Your second speaker for tonight is Rick De Santiago, who's working on his PhD at the Long Lab at SDSU. When he isn't pretending to be an invertebrate rolling around in seaweed, Rick actually studies how native invertebrates interact with invasive seaweed. For today's talk, he will take you on an adventure to understand how the ocean subsidizes the land. And now it's my honor to present Rick De Santiago. Hi everyone, can everyone hear me well? Thumbs up? Sweet, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so like Robert said, I'm Rick DeSantiago, uh, the Hood Scientist Online. I'm in my third year of my PhD program at, uh, in the Joint Doctoral Program in Ecology between San Diego State and UC Davis. I am also a proud member, maybe the proudest member of the Long Lab Mafia, uh, which means I'm part of a badass research crew that uh, is interested generally in a lot of coastal ecology. And we've got a fearless leader, Dr. J. Lo. Um, I was gonna make a really nice collage with everyone in my lab, but I figured this is actually more fitting for tonight. I just screenshot our last meeting. So there's a few people missing, but they shouldn't have missed the meeting. A little shade their direction. Um, so since I started my, uh, uh, the PhD program here, uh, my research interests have become more focused on the space between ecosystems, uh, the communities that live there, and the energy exchange between these systems. Um, and coastlines are maybe one of the most obvious uh, boundary systems, uh, though the interactions and the nutrient exchange in these uh, areas might not be as obvious. For example, um, for example the uh, ocean provides nutrients to the land in the form of seaweed rack. Uh, this decaying seaweed that you sort of just skip over when you're in the ocean, uh, that's a very crucial connection between uh, these two systems. Um, in this food chain, the seaweed that washes ashore is grazed on by herbivores and omnivores that, uh, that are along the coast, um, which are then eaten by uh, top level predators. And that's, the, uh, that's one of the food chains there. But as you can see from Gary Polis et al's work, uh, there are other pathways that make this food chain uh, more complicated than the cartoon I, I made here. Um, so while much of my work is focused on this, the, uh, the story that I'm going to tell you today is uh, about, about a more complex um, food web that I learned about in, uh, on a trip to the Coronado Islands uh, that, that my advisor invited me on, uh, along with Dr. Ruland Clark uh, and his students, Roman and Anna, and their collaborator, Jesus. So in a previous conversation that I wasn't there for, uh, Jeremy and uh, Jeremy learned that uh, there's a high density of rattlesnakes on South Coronado Island. Now I have no idea what those numbers were. I just know that they were a lot higher than they would be on the mainland. And I assume this photo is kind of how that conversation went. And uh, this is especially interesting because the island here shares uh, much of the flora and fauna uh, with, with the mainland, uh, specifically Cabrillo. Uh, for example, these alligator lizards, you see them, if you go to Cabrillo, uh, you see them everywhere. You also see them on, on South Coronado Island. Uh, these two are getting frisky probably because you got more privacy over there. Uh, and these two sites, according to Google Maps and my super GIS skills, are about 27 kilometers apart. Uh, you can actually see the Coronado Islands when you're at Cabrillo National Monument. So next time you're over there, take a little peek. Um, but to get to Coronado Island, you have to go to Mexico. You have to cross another man-made boundary, uh, the Tijuana border. And uh, that's exactly what we did. So we set off to explore this island that uh, is so similar yet so different to Cabrillo. And uh, of course, we also went to help the Clark Lab collect some uh, snakes. It wasn't just a free ride. And I'm not gonna lie, um, when Jeremy invited me, I kind of felt like we might be going to the Temple of Doom or something. Uh, but I was, I was okay with that. I was ready to fight off some danger uh, just to see the rocky intertidal zone there. I was so stoked for it. Uh, I wanted to see something that a lot of people don't get to see because the Mexican uh, Navy runs this island, so it, it's, it's not accessible to people. And so this is sort of what I envision, your typical SoCal rocky intertidal bench full of seaweeds and invertebrates. But this was reality. Uh, it was actually some steep ass hillsides that just sort of drop off into the ocean. And you can see in that circle, there's not a whole lot of exploring you can do there. And there was so much walking. Uh, we walked everywhere. It was like we were hobbits trying to return a ring somewhere. Um, actually, I took this video on my phone, so it's vertical. 
uh, see if I can get it to play. Yeah. So that's just us walking through some cheese weed, the same stuff that you see uh, out in yards here. But on this island, it's extremely huge. That's over six feet tall. I kind of got buried trying to trying to walk through it. And uh, there's a lot of thorny stuff too. So a lot of ankle busters just scratching you up. But lucky for us, uh, we got hooked up with some herpetology swag too. So I, I don't know what these things are called, but we wore some uh, like shin guard looking things that are supposed to prevent snake bites, but they also sort of protect your ankle. So that was nice. Um, and yeah, so we did a lot of exploring. I uh, learned a few things. Um, the whole island is super steep and there are no intertidal benches like I was hoping for. I mean, <laughs> look at the whole island. It's basically shaped like a triangle. Let's see if you can see my uh, cursor there. It's shaped like a triangle with one main ridge. And right here on the side, you can sort of see another uh, ridge that we also walked up and down. So not good for intertidal benches, but this is exactly what my advisor was anticipating. Uh, remember, I'm not an expert in this, and I don't want to speak for Jeremy, but I had no idea this is what we were going to see when it comes to the, uh, the densities of, of seabirds that were actually on this island. I took this photo of Jeremy maybe contemplating life. I don't know what he's doing there, but... Um, just look at those circles. Each and every one of those is one bird up in the air and on the, uh, on the ground, they're just sort of sitting there. So, so um, extremely high densities and wherever you have high densities of birds, you also have these super high densities of guano, that wonderful rich doo-doo, uh, nutrients everywhere. So um, surprise, surprise, this is what Jeremy was actually out here looking for. Uh, he wanted to understand if seabirds somehow impacted the terrestrial food web here and sort of create, created some effect that gave us this uh, increase in, in rattlesnakes compared to Cabrillo. And we sort of brought a tool for it too. We, uh, we came prepared. Um, we were using stable isotopes. So I'm going to try my best to explain stable isotopes in a couple of slides. But um, using carbon and nitrogen is isotopes, uh, you can actually figure out organisms' positions in a food web and you can figure out if their, their diets are primarily uh, marine based or terrestrial based um, with both carbon and nitrogen uh, differently, but you can still use both. And so here we're just going to focus on nitrogen for this, uh, this, this um, study here. Um, and when it comes to nitrogen, these two nitrogen isotopes that you see on the screen functionally are, uh, they, they function chemically the same. Uh, nitrogen 15 has slightly higher mass than nitrogen 14. Uh, and as slight as that mass may be due to just one extra uh, neutron, it requires more energy for the organisms to use that. And as a result, it accumulates in the body a little bit more than uh, nitrogen-14 does. So uh, in this analysis, we, uh, we looked at the ratio or the delta between nitrogen-15 and nitrogen-14. In uh, lower trophic levels like these ghosts here on the screen, you'll have a very similar ratio between these two isotopes. And the organisms that eat them, like Pac-Man, as it eats them, it collects that, uh, that nitrogen-15. And so you'll have a, a larger ratio of uh, nitrogen-15 compared to 14. And so that's one way of figuring out what uh, uh, trophic level the organisms are at. And so how do you use that to figure out if an island is subsidized by the ocean? So um, organisms that get their nitrogen from locally fixed sources have a lower uh, delta uh, N15. Which, uh, which means they're getting it from just their local area there and it's not subsidized. But if you have a place where it's being subsidized by a seabird or something that's uh, scooping out animals uh, from the water and it's, they've been collecting that, uh, that nitrogen isotope, you'll have a higher uh, um, nitrogen 15 signature and the, the isotope signature on these plants is gonna be more similar to the bird than it'll be uh, to the other plants on the mainland. In fact, uh, studies from the Gulf of California have showed that uh, seabirds increase the nitrogen-15 isotope in the food web. If you uh, look at this, um, this box here and just focus on the y-axis, again, carbon's important, but we're gonna focus on just the, uh, the nitrogen for now. You could see that there's a clear distinction between seabird islands and non-seabird islands. Uh, they almost don't overlap. So there's a clear signature of nitrogen-15 uh, from the guano of the birds. And I was actually sort of interested in what my own isotopes were when we were on this island because I had some questionable meals. Um, I brought tuna to feed myself while we were there. And I may or may not have accidentally taken some cat food. 
uh, because that's what my food looked like. And actually, you know, cat food looks a lot better, especially in commercials. This is, it was kind of disgusting, but hey, that's all I had. But anyway, we sampled plants and animals up and down the island. We found poopy sites and non-poopy sites. And we weren't just trying to compare these two sites. The, the, the main thing was comparing the, the island with Cabrillo. But we figured we could get a little bit better resolution by testing uh, two types of sites. And our amazing lab tech, Wendy White, uh, hooked us up with this really nice guide with images and species names that uh, we sort of relied, a lot, uh, uh, relied on. And this is a list of uh, organisms that can be found both at Cabrillo and at uh, uh, South Coronado Island. So we used um, uh, shrubs, perennial herbs, and annual herbs, as well as uh, snakes, lizards, and beetles for the animals. Um, so Jeremy and I heavily relied on this, and it uh, it kept us. Uh, uh, and just to keep to keep on the safe side, we sort of collected way more than we needed, I think. And when I say safe side, I'm not talking about safe side of the island because that I'm pretty sure did not exist. The whole the whole thing was sketchy, but it was fun. Um, so what did we learn? When, uh, when we ran this analysis, we learned that the, uh, the signature of nitrogen 15 is higher on South Coronado Island. So again, I'll direct you to look at the, uh, the y-axis here. And if you look at the black dots, that's South Coronado. If you look at the white dots, that's uh, Cabrillo. Um, and focus on the vertical difference here. They, uh, all of South Coronado sort of clusters up here and all of Cabrillo clusters down here. Um, so again, very different. And if we draw some arrows, you can see each species by, with its paired um, counterpart. And they all have that vertical change pretty much across the board. And I know you may be wondering, what about this little guy over here? Well, this is, I'm going to try my best to pronounce it. I think it's uh, Astragalus trichopotus. And the reason you don't see that vertical shift there is because it's actually a legume. Uh, so it's it's great it's getting its nitrogen from the atmosphere and the signature it'll it'll have is not going to be anything like the other two, um, which actually kind of worked as a control right it lets you know uh, if this experiment or if these samples are working for us so that was really nice uh, inadvertently helped us. Um, so it turns out that food web I drew earlier uh, is a lot more complex than than I personally imagine. Uh, another possibility is that these birds are eating fish and nearby animals. Again, the, the intertidal bench wasn't the, the biggest thing there, so probably relying on fish. And next steps, it's probably pooping. That poop uh, remineralizes, maybe goes into, into the plants, the animals that eat them, the uh, intermediate predators that eat those, uh, those grazers, and potentially is how we're getting um, uh, that high density of snakes. Now this cartoon is only one possibility again, and uh, I can't claim it's accurate without the data, of course. And so I'm not gonna try to convince you that this is real and that this food web is actually happening there. Instead, what I'll do is I'll tell you that this, this uh, uh, project has gone from sort of this experimental uh, uh, explore exploratory uh, um, fun trip to full throttle. Uh, in fact, remember that uh, undergrad I talked about earlier, Anna? She's actually officially in the same program I'm in. She's a PhD student, and she's gonna be co-advised by Jeremy Long, my advisor, and uh, Rulin Clark, the person who invited us on this trip. And um, Jeremy and Jeremy and Rulon, with, uh, along with a couple of their colleagues, uh, Sagala, Lester, and Lombardo, have actually secured some funding through the California Sea Grant and we'll hopefully go back to the island and find some more of these uh, of these secrets that it's hiding, and maybe we'll learn the uh, the real food web soon. Um, so that's pretty much all I've got. But before I go, I want to show you all some really cool footage of uh, the the Mexican fishers um, loading up one of the boats after we were done. For some reason, my mouse isn't showing up on on my screen, so I'll just skip forward. So what happened here is we just sort of beach the boat and jump out, unload all our stuff, and just let them do their thing. And Jeremy and I were just recording. So they reversed the truck. This guy uses his body as leverage, pushes it down, and they just sort of yank it in there. And he hops up, and he's using his body as a strap. Uh, if you don't appreciate this, you maybe you've never loaded up your own uh, boat, or you maybe work for OSHA or something. 
but this was badass and this is the second time we actually didn't get footage of the first time because it was we weren't ready for it we didn't anticipate this happening at all um but anyway that's what i'll leave you with and uh, with that i think i have some time for questions all right zeb you can go ahead and field some questions for that amazing speech that was very very cool i liked your uh, isotopic explanation by the way i thought that was very good all Thank right. You. I feel really hard. <laughs> I no, I think it was fantastic. It was very accessible. Brilliant. Uh, uh, Zed, why don't you go ahead and start with our first question? Oh my God, Rick, you got me cracking up there. <laughs> the last, <laughs> the last video. <laughs> awesome job. That is, that was an excellent presentation. Exactly yeah. what science communication should be about. Um, I think we all like the isotope explanation. Um, all right, we have some questions. Uh, I'm going to try and take them from the um, um, from the beginning. So, uh, Natalie is uh, wondering if we know what geological processes processes cause the shape of the island. I'm not sure. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's some story about um, these islands being more closely related to the Southern Channel Islands than they are to the Northern. Channel Islands, so I'm guessing some interesting plate tectonic plates or information there that I know nothing about, and I won't even try to explain it. I just know it's it's uh, uh, that what I mentioned. That's all I know. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, a question from Michelle: uh, Do you know what type of rattlesnakes are on the on these islands? Um, I don't, but there might be someone in here that can answer that. I think <laughs> Anna might be able to. Um, Again, I'm going to try my best with these questions, but this is not my area of expertise, and I, I don't mind trying, but I do not know what species. I, I remember, I, I sort of remember someone mentioning something about them being a lot smaller than the ones on the mainland. I don't know if that's a species thing or an island effect. Oh, I, I do know that I found the first one, and I thought it was a baby, and it was not a baby, apparently, but uh, yes, for everyone in the Clark Lab in here, I found the first one. Yay! <laughs> uh, great. Uh, uh, we want to hear about the cat food story at some point too, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't know what to say about the cat food other than I just went to the store and I bought a bunch of cans of, of, of tuna and just put them in my cabinets. And at some point when we packed up for the island, I, I got all my gear together and I just put cans in there. And some of them were labeled, some of them were not, but I don't have a cat, right? My roommate had a cat. And so I, it may have been cat food. I don't know. It was disgusting. Uh, Rulin brought some hot sauce and I just doused everything in hot sauce and wish for the best. <laughs> Unlike the Channel uh, Islands, there's nowhere to get food here. If, if you didn't bring food, you're, you're done for. So uh, water and food are super important and I wasn't going to waste any. Actually, uh, uh, Rulin offered me... Um, a drink he he likes on these islands which is uh he takes hot tea and adds a little bit of uh that cinnamon whiskey fireball stuff to sort of sweeten it up but also gets a little kick for you know to go to bed um but i i don't like tea and i didn't know what to do because i was really having a fun time ta fun time talking to rulin so i just took the hot water he gave me i never put the tea in there and i just added the whiskey so hot water and whiskey is actually pretty good just so you know Sounds really good. It's it's what I think we call the hot toddy, but it's it's oh, kind of with no a bit of lemon. Too, so. <laughs> I, I anyway, didn't... we're steering off the subject here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I do that. <laughs> no, it sounds great. I'm I'm sure the survival skills out there are pretty important. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, we have a question from Helena. Um, I'm not sure actually if I pronounce these names correctly. So um, if I if I don't, I apologize. How did you guys capture the snakes and lizards? Did you just take a small piece of the organism um, or- No, actually, um, so we didn't capture uh, a whole lot of snakes there. Uh, the the, the Ruin, Ruins Lab does a lot of that, but um, they brought them back and there's they're doing a whole other experiment. Uh, we're just collecting a, a scale or two or whatever for isotopes, but they do this whole other process. They uh, put the snakes to sleep shove them in a tube uh so they're just kind of sitting there they probe them like aliens i'm not sure what data they're getting from them but at the end of it uh roman who's actually i think he was in here i think i saw him in here um he was doing a uh, behavior uh experiment and so we had him in the uh 
in our makeshift little house there uh, for for the days that we were there. Um, so for for our samples, they just take a little bit of them. Uh, same with the uh, with the lizards. I think it was like a toe or something. Uh, for the uh, for the others, um, we for all the plants, we just shoved some of it in aluminum foil, wrapped it up, and then packaged it up for home. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> uh, Luke's, uh, uh, we have a question from Luke. Um, you skipped over the final details of how you got from the boat onto that nasty slope on the <laughs> island. How, oh. how did it go? So, so right on the other side of the island where you saw that picture, right on the opposite side of that, there's sort of like this little cove. Um, and there's a foundation because there used to be some sort of casino for gambling that, that they had out there. So when you, when you take the boat over there, it's still sort of a, a, a flat spot uh, with some parts of the pillar that are still left over. And so it's not by any means like a dock, right? You're not going to grab a ladder and, 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 and get out of the boat. You kind of still have to make that little bit of a hop, but uh, other people on the boat are holding it for you. And then you unload everything. And there's actually the, the Navy guys, uh, the Mexican Navy guys that are on the island are super helpful to get on the boat, off the boat, and carry your stuff up to up that giant hill. Oh, so it, it, was, it was sketchy to get off. Uh, I actually did have pictures of it. I should have included them. As you saw in this presentation, I tried to put in as many pictures as I could because they're so fun to look at. But I didn't want to just skip, skip, skip. But Luke, I, I'm, I'd be glad to share those photos with you. Please do. And if you have any photos that you like to post on the Nerd Night website or on the uh, Facebook page, let us know. Just send them our way and we'll share them with everyone. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I think we, we, we'll have time for one last question. Sounds good. Uh, a question from Michelle. Are those islands off limits at certain times of year because they're breeding grounds for the um, um, pelagic birds such as brown bobby? Booby. I think brown booby. That's right. I never heard of that one before. I think those so are they are off limits? I think they're off limits pretty much all the time. Uh, don't quote me on that. I just don't think people are able to access them. Uh, maybe they used to at some point, uh, but because of the military being there, I, I don't think that people are going onto those islands. Plus, if if you're just a visitor, I don't know what you're doing there. If you're a scientist, there's definitely cool things there. But um, if if there are any birds, I assume they're going to be off limit for sure during those times, uh, if not all the time. And again, there are definitely better people to ask this question to. I, I'm not sure. Just want to share this cool story about uh, about my adventure there, even though you know I'm sort of new to that island. Sounds fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for all the work that you do. It's very important. And there are a few more questions left on the chat. If you don't mind taking some time, answer the to answer the questions. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure to have you tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ed, and thanks everyone for who showed up. I appreciate it. Thank you.